Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of From the Park, the official St Albans City Football Club podcast. We're here to bring you a whole new perspective on the club you love, right from its heart of volunteers. We'll also be hearing from a plethora of special guests and familiar names, both new and old, bringing their views, insight and anecdotes, all for your listening pleasure. My name's Will, I'm a BA honours student studying sports journalism and among the volunteers that make up the St Albans City media team. This is my first season with the Saints but alongside me today is a voice a lot of you will be familiar with, Mr Jake Ellicott. Jake you've been a fan of St Albans City for a long time and involved with the media team here for a number of seasons now. Uh, You're currently the voice of the St Albans City Football Club live streams so is it fair to say you live and breathe this club? Uh, yes, sadly, that's one of the reasons why I don't have any hair anymore. The sort of this club, the stress, the toll it takes on you with the stress. But yeah, I've uh, been heavily involved um, on the media side since about 2013. Um, and yeah, but I've been a fan since about 2004, five. So yeah, been here a long time, um, but it's been very enjoyable for throughout. So Jake and I are just as surprised to be here as you are. We hadn't planned to start this podcast until a later date, potentially even the start of next season. We don't honestly know quite how things are going to pan out, how regularly you'll be hearing from us, but we do ask you bear with us while we find our feet. After all, uncertainty is quite on brand given the current climate. And with the amount of games being postponed across the leagues at the moment, we felt now was as good a time as any to try and create something to give back to our fans. So here we are. Today, we'll also be hearing from Sean Jeffers, St Albans' leading goalscorer this campaign. We'll be catching up with him on what it's been like within the St Albans camp this year, the spirit amongst the squad, what is clicking on and off the pitch, and hopefully a few exclusive stories from the training ground or changing room. But first, as there is no hiding from COVID-19, we've got Lee Page with us now to give us an update on how the inner workings of the club have had to adapt to the pandemic. How are you doing, Lee? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Uh, Busy, but uh, yeah, coping. Yeah, so I, I guess the part of the reason we've got you on is you're the guy behind making sure we're all safe at the club, be it players, uh, media staff, match officials, anyone like that. So I guess, I mean, first, do you, do you want to talk to us about, I guess, the challenges you faced and why you've made the decisions you've had to make? Yeah, so uh, yes, yeah, some, some has been driven by by government. So as we all know, um, we, we were classed as elite Um so we've had to follow the same protocols that have been laid down by um, DCMS, which is the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, that apply you know, the same as if you're at Man United, whether you're at Stevenage or ourselves. And in essence, what that is, is five stages that we have to go through. Um, so the first stage was really when we first started back to training. Um, and that was small group, non-contact training. Um, building up to the second stage, which then was contact training. Third stage, which is where we've been for most of most of this season, which is behind closed doors games. Uh, building up to the fifth stage, which is where we were allowed um, spectators back, unfortunately only for what was one, one game, unfortunately, in the end. Um, but hopefully that will change, change again soon. And if we go through what each of those were, they were all around you know, taking the current medical advice, government advice, and looking at how we can best um, implement either return to training or return to playing games in a safe manner. Um, Now, if we go right to the far end where we we got the spectators back, that was quite a a detailed involvement. Um, So we had to look at the risk assessments, identify the risks, look at the stadium, reconfigure the stadium, to make it safe for spectators to be back in. And as those that would have been here uh, for that game, they would have seen uh, feet painted round um, all around the terracing to identify where people could stand. And if you were seating, individual highlighted seats, etc. cetera. Um, but principally, you know, for, for the spectator side, it was really around the three core messages of uh, maintaining space, covering face and, and, and hygiene. Um, but that still applies irrespective of whether the spectators in the ground or whether it's behind closed doors. So some of the stuff we have to do behind the scenes, particularly with the players, is making sure that they, they, they follow those, those core principles, even when they're in, in the dressing room. Um, and even for, for the media guys, they have a particular area, the area of the ground that they're allowed into. Um, 
And then when they're interviewing players after the game, there has to be that physical separation. Um, so we have a dedicated area where they're allowed to do the interviews and, and, and you know, there has to be like a two metre separation. And as Jake will know from doing all the interviews, his, his face is muffled. Um, so you know, we, don't, we don't hear all of his dulcet tones effectively, um, but those are things we have to do to try and protect everyone. Yeah, I mean, so it's, I guess you can also reiterate, like, how important is it that everyone follows this? Because, um, I mean, obviously, what, what you're doing is something which will work at the ground and away from the ground. And obviously, we want our fans to stay safe as well. To just, like, how much of an impact does this have on preventing the spread? Obviously, you're the one who's got all the guidance and how important it is. Yeah, so... Yeah, it, you know, the, the new strain more than anything is, is really virulent like, from everything that's that's out there. And, you know, the, the, the core defence is, is hygiene, is making sure that you're not in close proximity to, to others. So actually, you know, though those three core messages of space, face and hands um, are, are vital. But, yeah, even more at the moment while we're in lockdown, um, it's following that advice of, of stay at home um, and only go out for, for the essential essential thing. Because if we can't, you know, the last thing we want now, particularly while we're in lockdown, is for, for the games to stop. And you know, although there's no indication of that at the moment, obviously if the virus carries, carries on moving, the government may have to put further restrictions in place. And, you know, it's not great in terms of lockdown, but at least for a couple of hours on a Saturday and on a Tuesday... Yeah, a little bit of normality with, with, with the videos, you know, from our guys, you know, from the, the players giving us a bit of entertainment, um, and that little bit of normality we, we want to keep as much as possible. So, yeah, for me, it's it's follow the advice that's out there. You hear it all the time, but you know, stay at home, um, protect yourself, um, and follow the, the three core things of just keeping your space when you are out and keeping your keeping your face covered. Yeah, I'm not sure if Jake's got anything that he likes to ask or add to this. Um, I sort of was just to add like sort of that hands face space how tough has it been to implement sort of with the sort of lads in the squad and the coaching staff in terms of like everyday sort of footballing activities I can imagine it's been quite an adjustment for everyone it, it is so if, if I take every training session um, beforehand Chris would just design his session on on his particular goals he wanted to get out of it what he has to do now is he has to do a further risk assessment on each individual part of that training session. Um, and each, you know, and then uh, there's a, like a grading mechanism that we have. So if, it, if the session becomes high risk, then Chris then has to adjust his training session appropriately um, to reduce the risk. And that can be um, sometimes not achieving his training goals. Um, but also, with, you know, with, 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 with players, with, with anyone, when, when you are together, you want to, to want to, when you want to be in a crowd and those are always the difficult things. So it's, it's that balance between um, allowing some of that interaction to happen, but having some of the protections in place. You know, so what we have been doing throughout is constantly talking to our players, making sure that they're, they haven't got any symptoms, constantly checking them at every session. And, you know, over the last months or so, we've actually been testing them as well with, with these lateral flow tests and, yeah, that's how we identified um, the outbreak in the squad just before Christmas. Um, there was two or three individuals that we identified that were asymptomatic. Um, and, you know, the, the key learning for that for me was we need to do more of that testing because actually if we can stop, stop the disease getting into the squad, then our protocols are reasonably good at, at hold, holding the rest of it at bay. But actually the virulency, especially of this new strain, is... If, even if even with the best protocols in the world, if you're in groups, you know, virus loves a crowd. So actually, we, you know, our protocols are, are strong, but actually we need layers of defence and testing has become a key part of that. Well, thank you for all the insight. Obviously, I think um, it's a hard time for everyone. I don't think anyone's enjoying not having fans at football or anything like that. But obviously, um, you understand how serious it is almost more than the rest of us. But um, yeah, so thanks for coming on and sharing it with us. No problem. So we are now joined by Sean Jeffers himself, uh, our leading scorer this year. How are you doing, Sean? 
Yeah, you're not too bad, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm doing all right. I'm sure Jake is as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously, um, you've had quite a career that's ended up with us. I mean, looking through the list of clubs, Coventry, obviously, where you started, you've played a few games in the Championship, played at pretty much most levels in this in this country. What, do you want to talk us through a few key bits that you remember, anything that stands out? Um, yeah, yeah. So, like like you said, started off at um, at Coventry. Um, I was there from from a young age, uh, from under twelve actually. So, uh, came through the academy um, and sort of broke into the first team when I was like seventeen, seventeen. So, so at a young age, like like I said, um, and um, yeah, I was lucky enough um, to get an opportunity to. To, to break in and get, make some championship appearances. Uh, obviously, at the time we was in the championship. I know Coventry um, moved up and down since then, but um, yeah, made my debut in the championship. So uh, again, yeah, that was a highlight highlight of a, my career. And um, around that time as well, I made a couple of um, England appearances. I played for the England under 19s. So um, yeah, again, that's another another highlight for me but um yeah I've been I've been uh, all over the country uh since then um but uh, now I've enjoyed it and I've uh, gained a lot of experience really yeah so I mean another thing that comes with that obviously you you've played in quite a variance of grounds I assume I mean from Clarence Park I think you must I think this might be my research being wrong but you played at West Ham away when they were still at Upton Park didn't you and so like there, there's quite some range of grounds you've played at like I mean but throughout all of that this is probably the first time in a long time in your career you've played in front of no fans so how, how different is it and how big of an impact was it when they came back I mean yeah it is a huge difference um, like you said I've played um, I was going to mention that I've played at Upton Park and played at some big grounds with some with a lot of fans and atmosphere um, but also People obviously don't see the other side of it. When you play in uh, reserve games and and behind closed doors games, you're you're still you're playing it, you're, but there's no fans there, and you've still got to have that sort of motivation uh, within yourself to to perform really. So I, obviously it's a shame that we can't have the fans there, but we're, we're trying to we're trying to still do that without them there. Um, the the other day the atmosphere was. Was was electric and it and it definitely definitely spurred us on, but um, we're still doing it for the fans really, and uh, and we've still got the goals and aspirations that we want to fulfil. So yeah, yeah, and and also I guess something which was in some ways nice was we 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 went top of the league with the fans there just before Christmas. Um, I mean Jake, maybe this is a chance to bring you in as someone who has been pretty much a lifelong fan. It must have been pretty special for you as well up on the gantry. Yeah, it was amazing to see fans in the ground. And I thought you, you know, Sean touched on it there. I thought you could see how the fans inspired the players because we went down, you know, a goal behind very early on. But the players reacted brilliantly, I thought. And, you know, I think the player, the fans obviously have been watching from home. It's been tough for them to connect. But a lot of the fans that I spoke to after the game sort of talked about, you know, how good this side does look. You know, players like yourself, Sean, they were, you know, they knew how good you guys were. But to see it in the flesh was absolutely brilliant and I can imagine that for the players that just to have fans that they just haven't been able to connect with for well, since they've joined the club like yourself Sean it must be so strange to be not really connected with fans you know and that's a key part of non-league for a lot of fans and footballers. Yeah definitely like you said that especially at like non-league level that is it's, it's vital as, or every level but the support and the Obviously, that you're in small grounds, the atmosphere it just like it just brings another level to to non-league football, and it's so important to the people, to, to local people as well. Um, so we we wanted to show that we wanted like we, we're behind them, they're behind us, and it's like it's a it's a good relationship that we've got. It's just a shame that we haven't been able to connect on that, um, or interact on that close levels. But we've we've been trying to show that in our performances and. Um, yeah, like you said before, it was like it was it was perfect as in the way we uh, the game that they got to see properly. We we actually went top of the league, 
and um, we put in a good performance after starting a little bit slow, should we say? So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was um, it was perfect for the fans to see that and go top of the league, and um, it sounded it sounded like they were they were happy with that. And was that also the game with uh, Luke's free kick? That was did did you think you'd be able to claim that, or or was it just a bit of a show? <laughs> I think I think I was close enough to uh, to put some pressure on the defender, but I don't think Luke could, I don't think Luke can claim it either. So uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, I think it, <laughs> it was definitely uh, while I, while I couldn't claim. So yeah, yeah. Well, another thing, obviously, um, that we can talk about that happened with no fans, and I would say, I mean, Son's goal was pretty good, but your one against Dartford. I mean, next year's Puskas Award, you never know. Do you want to talk through how on earth that, that crosses your mind at that point in the pitch in the 90th minute or whatever that, that you're just going to hit it? I, th- I think um, through that game as well, I, uh, I had like a couple of half chances and um, yeah, I just felt confident. And um, obviously it was nil-nil at the time. So in the end, it ended up being perfect timing to score that late and to be, and, and the winner against the t- uh, a side that's up there as well. Obviously, um, we, we'll be challenging to the end of the season, hopefully. But um, yeah, it was it, it sat it sat nicely. I kind of got across my across the defender, and um, it sat up nicely. And um, I, like I said, I had a couple of shots before that I hit the crossbar, um, and I just felt confident to hit it. And and yeah, I caught it nicely. So uh, <laughs> yeah, um, um, it hit the, it got it went in. Well, I was going to say hit the back of the net, but it, it didn't quite. It just went yeah. over the line, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, no goal on technology at this level yet, so it doesn't matter anyway. It's all good. Um, yeah, Jake, yeah. I think, were you, were you there that day? I was. I was on commentary for the highlights, and um, my voice, I pretty much lost it screaming at the goal. It was just unbelievable out of nowhere. But, Sean, after that sort of goal, and obviously the club, well, we posted it on the social media afterwards, and I think it got thousands of views a couple of days afterwards. What's it like as a player? So what, what's the next couple of days like? What do you get as a reaction from like other footballers and fans and the media as well? It's just, it must be madness, mustn't it? Yeah, it was. It was actually. My phone, my phone was blowing up. Um, yeah, it, I, got, I got a lot of reactions from all sorts of people, every, everyone saw it. I think um, probably not even football fans <laughs> recognised that <laughs> it was quite a good strike. <laughs> um, so, no, it was, it was, it was, it was a good, great feeling. I think, most importantly, it was, it was the winner. So, I think that added to the fact that it was, um, I, I struck it well, I hit, hit it well, but the fact that we won 1-0 in, in the 90th minute and it was, um, like I said, it was a top of the table clash. It just added to it even more. Yeah, well, I think um, from the celebrations alone, you could tell how much that kind of came across. I know I'm not sure how impressed the Dartford bench were. I mean, I wasn't there, but um, yeah, you made a beeline straight for the bench, and it was it was one of those celebrations that you kind of think you can tell it means something to the guys, and I guess it did, like because that was a big step to yeah. taking us up the table and against the team they had a few they played a few extra games as well and they were above us so yeah I mean things like that must be pretty special and also you you obviously ran over to where Ian was what's it been like uh playing for Ian here um at St Albans and and how does he do things and how how does it work for you I think I think I've always um sort of played against um Ian's sides before and um they've 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 always been top sides. I think um, last season was kind of the only season that I've really seen St Albans um, struggle a little bit. Um, but that was one of the main reasons I came to the club kind of thing. I knew, I knew, I knew what you get from um, an Ian Allenson side and I wanted to kind of um, hopefully go on that road and, um, and go up further and hopefully playoffs win the league that sort of that along them lines so um yeah I wanted to be successful really so um and once on, since I've come in I've you've know, had nothing nothing but that um we always uh we know that we've got a, a good squad um and I think everyone everyone takes that on takes that responsibility on to to help each other get better um I think all the staff and 
I think that 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 feeds through the whole club. Um, so yeah, when I when I when I thought about uh, signing for St Albans, those things have come have come to the forefront. So yeah, I'm really happy. And I think actually Jake will probably be able to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think we discussed this the other day. Obviously, Joe Chid came with you from Chelmsford. Who signed first? Was it intentional? What was it? Who followed who? Uh, I think, uh, oh, it, it definitely um, Joe signed first because um, uh, I think he, obviously we were going through um, lockdown and all that sort of, all those sort of things. And I think I saw, I saw Joe, or I spoke to Joe, but I know he signed nearly as soon as the season had finished kind of thing, sort of thing. He signed sort of early doors. Um, but again, I wasn't, weren't sure what was happening with the with the season with like with anything really so it was a bit up in the air but um yeah and no, I definitely was on the radar to um hopefully sign hopefully sign here but um yeah no I I signed kind of late later on in just before we came back to pre-season I believe um so yeah he he signed first but he was uh he was happy <laughs> when he uh, when he saw that I was um, I was signing, so uh, yeah, it was a little bit of a reunion, not 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 a long break, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, no, it was good to see him. But that that that's another thing this year with it being so different. Um, and I did watch someone's interview. I think it was Manash's player profile where he said that everyone in his squad gets along with each other and everyone knows everyone. Given the circumstances we we're in, and obviously the nature of playing at this level means people have other commitments. It's not all about football. How is the spirit of the squad at the moment? Because there's very little opportunity for socialising away from football, basically. When you're together, it's because you're playing football. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that is that is hard. Um, obviously, when you're, usually when you're at the club, you're, like you said, you're socialising and we, like you've obviously got to keep that to a minimum. Um Obviously, with um, COVID rules, etc., all that. But um, I suppose I think we've all got the same goal in our in our in our makeup in our minds. So I think we know we've obviously got um, we're chatting on group chats, we're chatting all the time. So it's not just kind of facial interaction like where you, where you're where you're talking to each other. So we're always in contact with each other, and um, I think that team morale is is, is high. It's not, and I don't think that's just because of where we're sitting in the league. I think that's just the the personalities that we've got in the in the club, and I think we gelled kind of as soon as we came back to to pre season because I think it kind of our form even started from then. But it, you probably can just tell the relationships by just obviously the fans wouldn't be able to see it in person, but um, yeah, we gel we gel well. We had uh, the same goals and and it. It's been good. It's been really good. I mean, again, Jake will be the one for the knowledge of this. Have you seen, have you, well, is it noticeable that this Saints squad have got that spirit compared to other teams you've seen? It, does this team stand out in any way? Like, how, how do you see it as a fan? I think you saw it straight away. Like Sean said, I was lucky enough to be at a lot of pre-season games. Um, and you saw even sort of games. One that sticks out for me is actually Watford under 23s out down at their training ground. You know, we drew nil nil, but it was against a good side, and we we you know dominated that game. And I think as Sean touched upon, you could tell early on that the side looks strong, but also looks to be really determined together. And I think that has been why we started so brilliantly. You know, last season we struggled at times, obviously before Sean came in, and now sort of. There just looks to be that desire and passion that I think a lot of fans, they just want to see. They just want to see the players fight for the club. And I think the squad have done that brilliantly so far this season. And I think, to be fair, I think it's been led, Ian has actually talked about this a lot. I think it's been led up front by Sean and Mitchell, who have really fought up there, battled for the ball, battling even defensively at times. And I think you guys have done a brilliant job so far. Yeah, and so then long term, looking at the rest of the season is it realistic within the squad are you are you trying to avoid getting in a sort of mindset where you think the league's yours and getting a bit carried away are you know it's there and it's in the back of everyone's mind or or are you just next game next game next game 
I think, yeah, we're definitely just thinking next game. Um, you In football, you have to think like that because every team is going to look at where we're sitting in the league and the unbeaten form in the league and it's going to be everyone's cup final. They're going to, they're going to try and or break that unbeaten record, really. So uh, we know we've got to take each game as it comes, give respect to to each team. But we know we obviously we know we've, we've got in the change room. We know what we can bring. So again, we're 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 confident. I think we've shown it all season. I think um, we've been organised. We've been we've got a great defensive record, and we know we can score goals. And so we're confident in what we've got and we, we know what we can do. So I think we we are positive. We have got that in the back of our mind, but we also have to, we take each game as it comes. Now, Sean, we're going to move on to a little segment that we are calling Saint Secrets. So we've got a few questions lined up for you, which um, hopefully will give a few details, which aren't obvious when Jake's commentating on a live stream or when we're watching player profiles. So the first one, to be fair, I think is quite friendly, which is that, uh, Who's the funniest in the dressing room? Funniest? Are we are we saying are we saying funniest for for actual banter or funniest for laughing at sometimes? Both, both. <laughs> obviously both. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think obviously you saw his, his player profile, so I think I've got to say Joe uh, Joe Chid. Joe Chid comes out with the most random things and you're thinking what has gone what is going through his head but um I suppose I'm used to that because he was at oh we were at Chelsea together so I kind of experienced it we had uh to be fair he used to come in with me as well so um we used to have a, look, a few car journeys um so I know I know what it's about but he is, he is quite funny to be fair I don't know if it's intentional or not but um yeah we'll go we'll go we'll go with Joe Chip. is he covering both of them then <laughs> Yeah, I'll just cover both of them. So yeah, this is this again. It's another one. We'll, we'll start easy and then we'll work our way through. Who who's the team DJ? Who well, or who's got the best and worst music taste as well? To be fair, I've got Gaffer makes us play this one song every time, which obviously is working because uh, we've we've been doing well. So uh, we've got that as a um, as a thing we do every game, but. Um, now nah, I'd say Kyron's Kyron's got the best music taste, but um, it's controversial because uh, we've got a mix of, um, of genres that uh, some people don't like. You always get a bit of controversy in the change room. There's some there's some songs that don't people don't like, and there's some the genres that people don't like. But it seems to be working. So uh, yeah, I'll go Kyron. Kyron in charge of the change in the dressing room then, or is it? Well, to be fair, it used to be Jamie. Um, but um, yeah, Kyron's taken over. <laughs> right. This is when we start getting to the juicy stuff. Who's the worst dressed? The thing is, we most of the time we don't even come in uh, in our in our normal clothes. So I think that's kind of that's a hard one to. Uh, true. True. Usually we've got that. Usually there's been like social situations where we come in our normal clothes and stuff like that. But obviously with um, circumstances it's been a bit been a bit different but uh, so we're usually in our track suits and stuff like that so <laughs> it's hard that's a hard one but uh, to be fair I'm gonna go with Luke <laughs> <laughs> what, how, why is that you, you know you know when you just got a, you just got a feeling <laughs> <laughs> you can I'm just gonna tell. go with Luke yeah, yeah. well I'm sure at some point he'll be on and he'll have a right to reply and he will explain himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he can reply. Who is most likely to be late to training or to a match or to any sort of event? Oh, 100% Sol. <laughs> Sol is... <laughs> to be fair, I thought I was always the last to come out until I've come to St. Albans and Sol is finished after me. I was like, some, sometimes, he, um, sometimes he strolls out to... Uh, the start of the game and you're thinking where's he where's he been <laughs> <laughs> we've got to start the game what are you what are you doing well actually with it <laughs> we had a game this year the first one with the fans back where like five people came out and then that was it and then it was like we waited two three minutes for the rest of the team to come out what was the story behind that 
I know, I know they weren't too happy, to be fair, um, the opposition, because um, we were taking the time, obviously, you have, you have to start on time, otherwise you get, you, you get those repercussions, you get fined as well, don't you, if you, if you start the game late, but um, yeah, luckily we seem to be just on time, but I think we need to, um, we need to make sure we're, uh, we're better on that front. <laughs> well, I guess that's something that is different this year. Um is the whole thing about coming out the tunnel, it, it's a lot more like rugby in that you kind of come out one at a time and you just run out and go and do your thing. There's none of this walking out together and shaking hands before the match or anything like that. Is that do you prefer it or is that worse? Um I swear it's just different because I wouldn't say it's better or worse. Um obviously it probably takes away some of the um some of the nerve for some people when you're just coming out, when you're standing there waiting to come out of the tunnel, sometimes some players find that a bit nerve wracking. So I suppose, I don't know if that's um, in our team, but for some people that they find that situation a bit nerve wracking. So it might be, that might be a positive for us, for some people. Yeah, I, I guess also, and again, Jake's going to be the expert in this, in this case. I think, perhaps the fact that this is happening with no fans in makes it a bit better because kind of a lot of that is kind of on show for the fans and you'd be lining up and facing an empty stand at the moment, which would be a bit weird. And it's just kind of all the mm. theatrics of it. There's, there's nothing to come. I don't yeah. know. Jake, yeah. Jake will be the expert on that and how it affects the fans. I was just going to ask Sean, as a sort of from a fan perspective and a goal scorer perspective, like the best moment of the game is when you score. Like it is like, you know, when the ball hits the back of the net, it's just, it's just brilliant. How does it feel as a goal scorer not to be sort of celebrating with the fans behind the goal or hearing, you know, that cheer as your strike hits the back of the net? I mean, what's that like for you? Yeah, it's a bit, it's a little bit weird in a game situation, but obviously, like when you're training and stuff like that, you're you're always trying to hit the back of the net. I don't think you, as a as a striker, you're always trying to hit the back of the net, whether sort of someone celebrates or not. Um, but yeah, it is a weird weird feeling. I think initially with that Dartford goal, I think like the, my natural reaction was to to like go towards the fans, and I was like, there's no one here. <laughs> <laughs> like I know this moment is special. Um, like spending it with um, or running towards the the dugout, and but initially my my instant reaction was to run towards the fans, kind of, and share that moment with them. But um, yeah, no. So it is a, it is a little bit weird, but I think as a as a goal scorer and a thing during training, or sometimes you do have like in your career, sometimes you do have games behind closed doors, and you're still. You're still trying to score. You're still trying to, still trying to win the game. You're still trying to do the best you can. So, do you, do you think it matters less or more to you as someone who is a striker whose job is to score goals? And like, I don't know if James Koloski hit a beautiful shot from the outside of the box and went in. Do you think he'd miss the fans more or less than you do? Um. First of all, James Koloski scoring from outside know. the box. <laughs> <laughs> I d- maybe maybe because he has hasn't got the score sheet as much as a, as a forward, it might. I, I, that's a good question. It probably would matter more to them if um, if it doesn't happen as often. But then that's always the motivation for a striker. So that there must be something in their psych, their psychological makeup that that's what they want to achieve. So uh, it's it's uh, yeah, that's a tough question. I don't know. Jake, have you got any other questions you'd like to add as a, as a state secret question that you think we can get some juicy juicy gossip out of? <laughs> tough, tough question actually. Um, who, which player does Ian Allenson shout the most at? Who does he shout the most at? Um, yeah, <laughs> who's most annoyed him this season I, so far? I think, I think Zane. Zane really. Zane. Interesting. No, not not for not for not for bad reasons mm. at the time, but I think um, Gaffer likes Zane's name, so that's uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good got, point. They've got, <laughs> they've got a um, they've got a father and son relationship there. <laughs> to be fair, I have to say what I've noticed from being at the games here, particularly when there's no one in the stands and you can hear everything. Ian Allenson is a master of chat. <laughs> yeah. 
is genuinely impressed with how good he is with his chance. Oh, oh, 100%. He knows what to say. He's, uh, he's experienced in that field, definitely. I think I, they don't have comebacks either as well. They struggle, they struggle with the comeback. Yeah, it's cool. brilliant. I think I think down at down at Eastbourne he managed to sort of annoy a whole stand of like officials and stewards um earlier in the season. So it's quite it's quite impressive really. But Will, you talk about that. Sean, as a player, is it is it easier to get messages across the pitch and organise without fans in the pitch, without fans in the ground, without the sort of background noise? I mean, one that sticks out is the Ebbs Fleet game where, you know, obviously we went down behind mm. and those tactical adjustments seem to be made from the bench quite easily and we sort of bounce back very quickly? Yeah, I, I'm, I'd say, yeah, it is easier. Um, usually, sometimes it might be hard to, to hear hear a bit of information. But obviously, you know, like you said, without the fans, it's, it's a lot quieter and you can hear you can hear everyone's voices um, when they're sort of giving instructions, from whether it be from the bench or whether it be on the pitch from other players. So, yeah, you can definitely... There's no... When there's fans in, I think some players pretend that they can't hear. So uh, <laughs> there's, an there's, there's no, for... yeah, there's no excuses now. You you can you can hear what's going coming on from the side or whatever. But um, yeah, so you can't pretend you haven't heard anything. One other thing I thought we'd ask from within. I mean, Jake will have his opinions as he knows everything about Melbourne City, and I think he, he's got a name for each blade of grass. Um, like which players? Um, in the squad, do you think people should be looking out for the rest of the season in coming years? Obviously, you signed a few youth academy guys who've been training with you in and out, and they come to a lot of the games. And then you've got a few players who haven't, because we're we're doing so well, who haven't quite had the time on the pitch as you might expect normally. Which, which players do you think people need should be watching out for this season and into the future? Um, yeah, I think um, from sort of the, the starting lineup, I think um, definitely. Um, Manash, um, Manash and I has been he's been doing really well for us. I think he's still still at a very good age as well. Um, could progress on and um, do further. I think um, obviously Mitchell's strike partner as well. He's um, he's been he's been sort of he's been doing well. He's been um, both keeping each other on our, on their toes. So uh, <laughs> he's been doing very well. But I think obviously we like I said we have got strength in depth, um, but players that sort of you haven't seen as much of I'd say um, I'd say Romeo as well Romeo Romeo is very uh, sharp and um, I think he could give us uh, uh, sort of another dimension off the bench as well at times because um, I think he at first he struggled with, with an injury so he's back he's back fit now and he's looking sharp so hopefully um, hopefully yeah he can he can make an impact as well. I think in going forward into the future and stuff like that. But I think um, yeah, we've we've got a good mix in the in the team. I think of uh, experience and people wanting to come through and do well. Yeah, right. So I mean, thank you, Sean, for for joining us. I mean, we now know to to watch out for whatever Luke Wanneridi's wearing for one thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's been an honour to have have you with us. Um, Hopefully, we'll end up with more episodes of this coming out soon. This is obviously a pilot, like we said way back at the start, me and Jake recording this. We don't know when the next one will be, but hopefully there will be a next one. Um, Sean, I don't know if you want to plug your socials or not, but you're welcome to. Um, yeah, if you want, it's uh, S underscore Jeff 14, Instagram. There we are. Um, but, um, oh, go on, continue. Oh, so I just want to yeah, just um, appreciate you having me on and um, hopefully, yeah, uh, hopefully, um, there'll be more of them yeah well um obviously you can keep up to date with the club as well on twitter instagram uh twitter is at st Albans city fc and the instagram is at st Albans city underscore fc um and yeah so we don't know when we'll be back but hopefully we will be back and back with another guest so thanks for listening and we'll see you soon <laughs>